So Nathan, for those who didn't know you that much, can you like introduce yourself for the audience? Sure, mate. Yeah, so my name is Nathan Kiley. I'm a strength and conditioning coach in Brisbane, in Australia. Uh, and currently I work at the Brisbane Broncos where I'm the speed and rehab coach. Well, so how's the season goes, the last season? Yeah, uh, so we're halfway through our current season at the moment. Um, we're going, the team's going really well. We're top of the table, top of the ladder. So, um, the performances on the field have been really good. Um, we've still got a long way to go though. So, um, we're not counting our chickens just yet. We're, um, we've still got a fair few games to play and, um, some, Obviously, uh, hopefully we're in the final series at the end of the year and there's going to be big games there where we need to perform if we want to uh, finish the way the season that, that we hope to. Nice, nice, nice. So the first question I have for you is like, I saw your YouTube channel and discuss about like the maximum aerobic speed. So can you like explain to us what is maximum aerobic speed? So maximal aerobic speed is um, like a, a proxy for the velocity of VO2 max. So in a laboratory, um, if we want to test an athlete's aerobic um, energy system performance, we would perform a VO2 max test. So they're in the lab, they've got um, a mask on that's measuring their oxygen uptake. Um, and then we're, we're assessing that uh, both from a... Uh, a, a total oxygen uptake perspective, but also the velocity at which they can run um, when they attain their maximal oxygen uptake. Um, the the VO2 max test, though, is quite time-consuming and invasive to perform. So what we can do instead is perform a field test, which um, gives us a maximal aerobic speed, um, which is pretty strongly correlated with what you would get in in laboratory testing, but it's not a it's not perfect. Um, but that does allow us to assess our athletes. Uh, it's essentially the equivalent of a, a one rep max, but for your aerobic energy system, um, and and that can be used whether it's for running performance, um, cycling performance, um, performance on a rowing ergometer, or whatever. Um, mixed training method or tool you want uh, and and typically how we assess maximal aerobic speed is through a standardized test generally a five minute time trial or five to six minute time trial uh, or a distance that's going to result in a time within that sort of range and then we're just looking at the it's a maximal test and we're just looking at the athlete's average speed um, during that assessment Cool. So, uh, what is it different with the anaerobic speed reserve? So, uh, anaerobic speed reserve is the difference between an athlete's uh, maximal aerobic speed uh, and then their maximal velocity. So, if we take running, for example, we've got our top sprinting speed, which could be measured with uh, timing gates or GPS unit. Um, a speed radar, whatever we want. We're looking for maximal instantaneous speed. And this is going to be in a short duration sprint. So typically a 30, 40 meter sprint effort or a flying sprint effort. Um, and then we're going to uh, have a look at the gap between that velocity and our maximal aerobic speed. And this allows us to profile athletes and better understand um, whether they are fast and fit, which is optimal. They might be fast not fit, which means that we've got a rate limiting factor potentially for performance uh, in terms of their aerobic performance. We might have someone who's fit and slow, which means that we probably want to work on their speed qualities. Uh, or finally, we've got someone who's slow uh, and unfit. Uh, and generally, they're probably not playing sport at a very high level because they're not very talented, unfortunately. So, uh, how can like performance coaches use like uh, the maximum aerobic speed or like anaerobic speed reserve to help uh, your athlete have a better like conditioning? Yeah, great question. So like I mentioned before, maximal aerobic speed is like the one rep maximum for our aerobic energy system. So what that does is it gives us a physiological 
landmark from which we can prescribe training. So this is where the utility in the tool comes from. So what we can do, and there's a there's a bunch of um, well-documented protocols that recommend different work-to-rest ratios at various percentages of maximal aerobic speed, and we can use them to prescribe um, aerobic and even anaerobic conditioning to our athletes. Um, above and beyond that, our, our anaerobic speed reserve is also an important tool for being prescriptive um, for energy system development. And the reason for that is that um, if we've got an athlete who has a large anaerobic speed reserve, what we'll often find is that uh, for short uh, short intervals, their, their speed qualities can mask their lack of fitness uh, and vice versa. If we've got someone who's well aerobically conditioned but has a relatively low maximal velocity, if we're prescribing super maximal um, maximal aerobic speed training, so say for instance uh, a fifteen second effort at one hundred and thirty percent of maximal aerobic speed, that could be very close to their maximal sprint speed. In which case, they're going to end up getting a a pretty uh, high intensity stimulus, a bit of a lactate bath there, and they might not actually be able to cope with it. So when we get into the realm of super maximal prescriptions where we're above 100% of maximal aerobic speed, um, sometimes it's a good idea then to switch to an anaerobic speed reserve um, prescription that's going to be able to individualise a little bit better across the spectrum of uh, the different profiles within our athlete cohort. Um, a really good example of where that works is um, take tempo running, for example. So the the classic track and field Charlie Francis style tempos where we're talking about your sort of 100 metre efforts. They could be on the minute and we're looking at 70 to 80% of maximal velocity. Um, sometimes we'll see uh, bit, athletes might get prescribed uh, distances or times that are based on maximal aerobic speed and that's just not going to be appropriate for them. Um, vice versa, maximal sprint speed is actually also not the greatest tool if we're looking for an aerobic stimulus. So if we use something like 50% of our anaerobic speed reserve, we're going to find that midway point perfectly between top speed and our maximal aerobic speed to uh, determine like that tempo velocity. Uh, and that's the prescription that I've used in the past when prescribing tempo tempo running to my athletes. Uh, and I find that that's a good way to find an appropriate stimulus. Oh, cool. so can you also like give us an like, example, like how would you use, uh, or how would you use like uh, the MS to help your athlete condition? Yeah, okay. So um, I'll give you a few examples. Um, there is a whole different bunch of protocols that we can use for conditioning. Um, and the ones that I'll speak about are generally for team and field sport athletes because that's what I'm familiar with working with. Um, in an early preseason block, we could um, perform sub-maximal efforts of long intervals. Um, we could do eight minutes on, three minutes off. We could do three or four efforts of that. So that's quite a, an extensive protocol that we would use for maybe only one or two sessions at the start of a pre-season to build a base, so to speak. And we would prescribe a velocity of 75 to 85% of maximal aerobic speed um, for, for a session like that. Um, another example of a long interval session could be four minutes on, two minutes off. Um, we could be performing one to two sets of four to six reps on a protocol like that. Uh, and for those, we could be 85, 90, maybe even pushing up towards 95% of maximal aerobic speed. Um, but that's going to be, in terms of an RPE, that's going to be quite a hard session to perform. So those are a couple of examples of sort of longer intervals. But more commonly, what we'll typically do are short intervals, so short high-intensity interval um, prescriptions. And these are the ones that I'll roll out sort of 95% of the time. They're going to be um, your typical sort of um, Eurofit short high intensity intervals. This is your one to one work to rest ratio. Typically, they're either going to be 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off, or 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. 
and I'll usually prescribe them anywhere between 115 and 130% of maximal aerobic speed. Again, this is probably a prescription where anaerobic speed reserve can be a useful tool as well, in which case you're probably looking at 25 to 30, um, yeah, 25, sorry, 25 to 50% of their anaerobic speed reserve. Um, another example would be uh, like a short tempo. Um, I'll generally prescribe these uh, 10 seconds on, 20 seconds off. Um, and these could be 130 to 140% of maximal aerobic speed. And like I said before, around 50% of anaerobic speed reserve. Um, then we've also got protocols that include active recoveries. Um, so the BILAT protocol, which is quite popular, where we're working at 100% of maximal aerobic speed for 15 or 30 seconds. And then we've got a, an active recovery at 50 to 70% of maximal aerobic speed for the same duration as the work period. So 15 seconds on, 15 seconds off, or 30 seconds on, 30 seconds off. Um, one more example, probably that the last one that I'll commonly use is a Tabata protocol where we're 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off. Um, and that's going to be close to maximal effort. Um, but if we're trying to be prescriptive, we could do a 140% um, of maximal aerobic speed for that. Now, for all of those protocols and the suggested uh, intensities that I've sort of um, recommended there, they're generally going to be four minute blocks. Um, if you want to have a slightly longer block, you could extend them out to five or six minutes, in which case you're going to have to pull back a little bit on the intensity, or you're going to basically expect your athlete to be put in a pretty big hole um, to try and maintain that intensity for, for much longer. Uh, and then the flip side of that is if you want a mixed conditioning um, sort of method where I'll commonly use this in rehab where I might have um, some different cone drills or patterns or an agility exercise that I'll bounce between conditioning and, and, and a different exercise. And I might only do two minute blocks of conditioning where we're just trying to clock up um, some volume, get a little bit of fatigue into the system, and then we can bounce into a different activity. Uh, do you like is it is is the condition work mainly you do in off season or do you do some like high interval high in, intensity interval training in the in season? Um, so it's it's always going to depend on the context. Um, I have used all sorts of different protocols at different times of the year. Um, the philosophy here at the Broncos where I work at the moment is we try and prioritise getting our conditioning through skills work. Um, so our head of performance works closely with our sports scientists. Um, they're looking at GPS, looking at work to rest ratios, duration on drills, working with the coaches to design better drills um, so that we can drive intensity in skills. We'll have a look then at... Um, the duration that our players are spending above uh, game speed, for instance, or above match intensity on a, on a variety of different metrics. And based on that, we'll identify players who we think haven't done enough. Uh, and it might not be their fault. It might just be um, the drill on the day or for whatever reason. Uh, and then we will um, identify which athletes need to be topped up with additional traditional conditioning. Um, and then we'll decide which protocols to use based on what type of stimulus we think that player might need. So an example there might be an outside back in rugby league where generally they're going to get a lot of high speed and very high speed running. We might then use a tempo protocol where we're going to get them into upright running at high velocities. Um, a middle forward in rugby league, we might... Um, Oftentimes, we won't even use an MAS prescription there at all because their position uh, is more changes of direction up and down off the ground, and we might just use conditioning drills uh, to provide a stimulus for them. Um, so it's, it's really going to depend on the athlete, their their goals, what their, what's the rate limiting factor for them and what they haven't got through skills so that we can identify like the gap that we're going to fill and pick the right tool to, to address that for them. Cool. So I'm gonna ask a question, and it's probably gonna be it's it's probably a easy question for a lot of coaches. 
But like you mentioned, why is that like 95% of the time you uh, train high in intensity interval training? It's a great question. And um, to be honest, I actually think there is a case to be made for doing a little bit more low intensity training. Um, I do think that we place a lot of neuromuscular stress on our athletes by always using high intensity methods. Um, and in particular, when I'm performing off legs training or cross training where we're getting athletes on bikes and things like that, I'll often divert to doing more extensive uh, methods so that we can spend a bit more time in a higher heart rate zone uh, without necessarily accumulating that uh, peripheral fatigue. Um, but the the evidence does show that short high intensity methods are very potent stimulus and they're a really good way for making fast changes and getting um, those those adaptations that we're after um, with less time cost. The energy cost is high, but the the time that's required to um, to to get that work done when when we're in a time poor environment uh, it does allow us to achieve our goals quite quickly um, but also there is a lot to be said for those those neuromuscular the neuromuscular stress that we can apply as well so for example like I mentioned before if we've got an outside back whose job um, involves a lot of high speed very high speed running uh, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for us to send them on an eight minute interval where they're accumulating a lot of volume, but they're not getting that um, like the hamstring and calf conditioning effects that we would otherwise get with a high intensity method. Um, again, they're all just different tools and it's about picking the right tool at the right time for the right individual. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that I'd um, throw any of them out and, and write any of them off um that they've all got a, a place at the, at the right time well so um is there like because i know coaches in the state or coaches in town are not very familiar with like uh not gonna say not but they're more into like power training so when it comes to like a speed and power athlete like rugby like soccer like even football it always when we like when we need to like condition our athlete, it always comes to like HIIT or like Tabata you mentioned. So, uh, uh, besides like H high in intensity interval training, is there a way like like you mentioned longer way or like to help athlete like recover or like? Yeah, well, I mean. Th the one of the most common protocols that we'll use is a 10 second on 20 second off type um, tempo method and and that's where i was sort of alluding to in terms of like we can get some really good quality metrics into our athlete um but the metabolic cost isn't uh it's not maximal like i i think we can achieve a lot of really good work with an rpe of around 7.58 even eight and a half instead of using an RPE of nine, nine and a half, ten. I think if you spend a lot of time at nine, nine and a half, ten, um, you, you're often going to bury your athletes. You're going to destroy their motivation to train um, and you're potentially exposing them to a risk of injury because those sort of intensities are hard to sustain um, over the long, the long term and to do them day in, day out, week in, week out. Um, if you just pull back a little bit on the RPE, and that's going to depend a little bit athlete to athlete in terms of what they can handle, and find that sweet spot where you can achieve some high quality outputs, get the work done, um, but leave just a little bit in the tank, then I think you're going to um, reap the rewards. And I think the the analogy I'll use is that, I mean, if we, if we wanted to develop strength and power in the weights room, we wouldn't just 1RM our athlete every day. We wouldn't, we wouldn't just max them out over and over and over again because we know that you're just going to put them in a hole that they won't be able to recover from. Um, you don't need to be at, at complete uh, failure to make gains and to make progress. Um, so we find those sweet spots, find those zones where we're applying a stimulus and applying an adaptation that they are able to recover from. Um, and then we rinse and repeat and we go again and, and we make progress over the long term. Nice. So, can I ask you a 
a really like hard question about like is so CrossFit is sort of like sort of like uh high intensity interval training. So how is it different with like the thing you mentioned? And do you think we should train our athletes like CrossFit? Um <clears throat> I don't have a problem with CrossFit in terms of the work to rest ratios that they use. And I don't have a problem with the intensity that they use. The only issue I would have with CrossFit is how it's periodized and progressed. Um, I think a really smart CrossFit coach could actually do a fantastic job developing athletes um, if if they have a rhyme and reason behind their progressions and um, build on each workout and and sort of take the athlete on that journey rather than the chopping and changing workout to workout. So um, in terms of does the intensity, the work to rest that we see in CrossFit necessarily, is that necessarily a bad thing? I would say no. I think that's fine. Um, it's not, I, I would try and, um, apply more of that to the field setting, um, because that's where we're going to get the best transfer to a field sport athlete. Um, in the weights room, I tend to think we're trying to support what happens on the field. So we develop strength and power qualities and develop tissue tolerance so that they can handle those demands on field. Um, I feel like CrossFit's almost like a uh, a field sport in the weights room rather than a field sport on the field. Uh, it's a bit of a tricky question. I haven't put a lot of thought into it before, but um, yeah, thinking out loud, I, I guess those are my my thoughts on that. All right. So, uh, is there a test you prefer to use for like the MAS? Um, I've used a few different ones. Uh, just a simple five-minute time trial is often the easiest to administer. Um, get yourselves on an athletics track and send your athletes off, and when they get to five minutes, just tell them to stop. Um, if you're working with really well-conditioned athletes, a two-kilometre time trial can be a good test. Um most team and field sport athletes are, I think, around a 1.6-kilometre time trial is probably more appropriate. And then if you're working with younger athletes, uh, athletes who aren't as well-conditioned, 1,200 metres or a 1.2-kilometre time trial um, can, can land you in that sweet spot as well. The problem with a time trial that's um, distance covered in time is that it's a bit tricky to figure out how far the athletes have covered. Um, if you're using a five-minute time trial on an exercise bike or on a rower or something like that to prescribe off-leg conditioning, that's really easy. Um, but running can be a little bit tricky. So that's where like a 1.6K time trial um, can be a bit easier to administer and record scores for with our athletes. Another common one that gets used in, in rugby league and rugby union is the, the Bronco test. So that's a 20 meter out and back, 40 meter out and back, 60 meter out and back shuttle performed five times over. Uh, so each each 20, 40, 60 return shuttle is 240 meters. So five of those gets you to 1.2 kilometers um, with those changes of direction in there. So you'll generally see around a, a four and a half to five minute um, finishing time for that test. Cool. So uh, what about some tests you you use for like the anaerobic speed reserve? Um, well, it's really simple. Once you've done your maximal aerobic speed assessment, you've got their MAS, then it's just about measuring their maximal sprint speed. Um, that anaerobic speed reserve is just going to be the difference between those two. So um, we, we've we got a combination of timing gates and um, GPS here. We've also used video analysis. Um, each of those tools has a little bit of error in them. So we make a little bit of a judgment call athlete to athlete on what their what we think their true max is. And obviously that's going to fluctuate um, throughout the season. So, um, yeah, I mean, you, you can pick any number of different things as long as you're um, consistent, I suppose. 
Um, I mean, having said that, we're not particularly consistent. We, we're using different different ones to get a sense of uh, in in really clean, optimal conditions uh, indoors on a basketball court. We'll get the timing gates out. Um, we've got GPS outdoors on the field, capturing uh, speed in games. And then we also do some video analysis during speed sessions uh, on the field as well. So um, you can use any number of, of tools to, to measure top speed, as long as you understand what the limitations of each of those are. Um, for instance, um, we changed GPS providers at one point and we found a big discrepancy between our old top speeds and our new top speeds coming from GPS. Um, which sort of showed us that those units were not comparable between each other. Um, so we sort of needed to wipe the slate and and start again with, with our top speeds. Nice, nice, nice. So that's kind of all the questions for like uh, the energy system. Next thing I want to ask, or next thing I want to discuss is, I saw you implement a lot of like the Francois system work into your own training. So, uh, what do you feel like uh, implement? Does that like does Francois system help you a lot with like transferring to like sprinting or like transferring to like multi directional speed? It's very difficult to measure transfer of training, um, particularly in a field sport. Um, oftentimes, I'll implement a new exercise at the same time as implementing several other new exercises so to be honest i couldn't tell you if it's transferring um but what i will say is um they they are great exercises for targeting specific tissues and it's very obvious that they do that by you do these exercises you know that you're working specific components um that are relevant to running um we do need to rely a little bit on theory in terms of um, what aspects we're targeting and why. But those exercises, for me, I, I see them primarily as a tool to prepare the body and potentiate performance. Um, so I'll use them in my prep. I use them in my athlete's prep. We're using them to sort of activate the athlete. I think it's a more specific and relevant way to perform activation than say mini bands around the ankles doing glute work, I would rather go and do some sort of Bosch inspired work that's going to be specific to running, um, which is a big KPI and um, relevant aspect of performance for them. Uh, and generally, I think it helps warm up the athlete so that when we go onto the field, if we need to run fast, uh, it doesn't take as long for our athlete to feel prepared to do that because they're they're switched on and ready to do that because of these exercises that we're implementing. So do you also implement some like single leg uh, clean or single leg snatch, that kind of stuff? Uh, I've played around with them. I, uh, I'm not convinced by them. I, I don't think they're – I think they look cool, but I, I'm just not convinced that they – are all they're cracked up to be? I think um, if I'm, if I'm so, and Franz would admit this himself. We've got uh, an interplay between specificity and overload. The more specific we make something, the less overload we can apply. So, in the weights room, if my objective is to develop leg power, I'm not going to worry too much about specificity. I'm going to worry about how do I apply overload to generate those adaptations to change muscle tissue, to increase um, all those neuromuscular uh, and neurological um, sort of adaptations. And then from that, I'm going to work on skills in a more specific manner so that we can then transfer and apply those adaptations into our sporting skills. Um, that's why I'll often say, for example, have an exercise like a power clean, a traditional power clean, but I'll uh, superset that with some sort of jump plyometric movement-based exercise where we're taking some of that potentiation, that aspect of leg power, and then trying to coordinate it into a more athletic um, or field-based sort of movement pattern that's going to transfer a bit more. Um when I look at like the Bosch clean or the Bosch snatch, 
I think you get really caught in that muddy gray area right in the middle where you're not lifting enough load to really develop leg power. And you're also sort of doing something a little bit clunky and like the barbell is not a tool for sprinting. It's, it's a tool for the weight room. So it just, it just doesn't quite tick either end of the spectrum for mine. Um, Having said that, I have prescribed it to athletes in the past at times. I think at the right time for the right athlete, it can be a nice variation to um, help them uh, see some transfer from the weights room, um, to challenge them in a new way or a new aspect. There's value in that. I'm, I'm not discounting it. But generally speaking, um, yeah, it's probably probably not something that I would say is a big part of my programming. Cool. Oh, so do you do you teach your athlete the full like the full power clean, like pass the pass the bar? Do you teach Yeah, them? I I for me, like if, if we're gonna like I'm a strength and power, like I'm a strength coach, right? So if I can't teach someone how to catch a clean properly, I'm not doing a good job. So in in my opinion, there's really no excuse for like ugly cleans. Like if if someone can't catch a clean properly and it's because of previous injury or something like else, then I'm probably going to pick a different exercise for them. Um, but if there's nothing wrong with them, I'm going to teach them to catch it properly. Um, for me, it's really important as a prerequisite that the athlete knows how to front squat. They know how to get into a front rack position. They know how to receive the bar. Um, before we'll power clean, I'll always get my athletes to spend a minute or two doing some barbell drills just to groove the movement pattern. Uh, it helps them warm up. It helps them feel their receiving position. Uh, it doesn't take long to learn how to clean properly. In, in my experience, like I've seen kids learn how to do it in 15 minutes. Like it really isn't that complicated. I think people make it out to be harder than it is. And it is harder to coach it when you're trying to chase an adaptation from day one. If you just take a little bit of weight off the bar and focus on teaching the skill first and foremost, then you can chase all those adaptations for the rest of their training life down the line because you've taught them how to do it properly. Um, so yeah, as far as I'm concerned, there's like if you're if you're a strength and conditioning coach and you can't teach the Olympic lifts, um, I think you probably need to have a bit of a look at yourself. Um, having said that, I'm not married to them. We we don't have to use the Olympic lifts. We can jump shrug. We can jump squat. We can trap bar jump. There's nothing wrong with all those other um, variations. And I've got plenty of athletes who've never power cleaned with me before. Um, but at times, if, if we've identified that this is an exercise that's going to work for this athlete, um, I'm going to make sure I teach them properly. Having said that, I generally I won't full clean athletes. I'll, I'll power clean them. And most of the time we'll hang power clean. Um, some athletes in the past I've hang power snatched, um, but that's probably an exercise I, I teach less. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're all just tools that we've got in our toolbox and it's about picking the, the right one for the the right athlete at the right time. And um, and then if we decide that's the path we're going down, I, I'm a pretty firm believer that you teach them how to do it properly. Nice, nice. So are you going to go max for the hand power clean or like power clean? Um, I mean, it's not something that I'll generally test with my athletes. Um, I'll often ask when when I have used I haven't used it a lot lately to be honest but um, when I have been using it more regularly we'll look for like a heavy double um, it's not necessarily a performance test it's more sort of embedded testing into our training um, and it's a general leg power development tool um, in terms of assessments that I'll do for leg power, they're generally going to be more force plate assessments around counter movement jumps, um, drop jumps, or 10 5 reactive strength index. Uh, those sort of assessments are going to be the ones that I'll track. Uh, and then we're using like the power clean, for example, as a training tool to develop leg power that's going to transfer into, into that assessment. Cool. So uh, I know, I know that. There's gonna be some coaches use 
power clean through during the season to maintain their uh, strength and power during the when it's in season. What is what what are your approach on on this kind of like training? Yeah, like I I don't have an issue with continuing to power clean in season. Like in our environment, we have a very long in season period. It's twenty seven weeks is our in-season phase and they're consecutive weeks. So if we go, oh, we're in season, we're going to stop training hard, then by the time we get to our final series at the end of the year, we will have detrained and we'll be less physically prepared to perform at our best. So we continue to train hard and chase adaptations all year long. Um, so if, if, it, if it's an appropriate exercise for the individual, um, I don't see any issue with continuing to use a power clean in season. Um, in our environment, because it's a contact sport, it's not uncommon for athletes to have hand, wrist, finger injuries um, from the contact. Their fingers get caught in jerseys or they land awkwardly, things like that. So we'll often um, not use the catch and instead we'll use like a clean pull or a jump shrug or some other derivative of the Olympic lifts just because they're a little bit easier um, on their body, um, but we're still getting the same sort of adaptations there. Oh, so uh, would it usually how heavy would you would, would your athlete like? Let's say if they have like two, like two times body weight of their like back squat, how heavy is is their power clean going to be like? I think it depends predominantly on their skill level in terms of their skill of performing the Olympic lifts. Um, it's if, if they if they haven't done it a lot, they we might have like we'll have guys who are two hundred kilogram back squatters um, below parallel. They they are very strong, but they might only power clean a hundred kilos, one hundred and ten kilos because they don't have the skill in terms of turning the bar over, receiving it in a, in a good catch position um, and, and having the balance and stability to catch, to catch the, the clean. Um, but when someone is well-skilled, they've done it before, they've got good technique, they know what's going on, it wouldn't be uncommon for those sorts of athletes with similar strength qualities to be uh, 140, 150, perhaps even 160 kilo power clean. Um, but again, that comes back to their exposure to the lifts. How often they're doing them? Are they doing them regularly? Uh, have they got a technical focus when they're performing the lifts? Um, but then going further than that, like if we, if we look at actual Olympic weightlifters, then the gap gets narrower between their, their back squat, for example, and their, and their clean because, um, they're predominantly focused on, on that skill element, um, so, yeah, I, I don't think there's like a a rule of thumb or a ratio that we should chase. It's it's really about um, nailing the fundamentals of the technique, uh, refining the technique, and then layering the intensity on it later. And, and we just sort of see what happens, I suppose. Nice, nice. That's kind of like all the question I have for today. So for those who are interested in what we're talking about today, where can they reach out to you? And also, where can they find the coaches' education and the webinars you have? Yeah, so um, like I'm pretty active on Instagram. So um, the best place for any of that stuff is going to be uh, my Instagram profile. So my handle's just my full name, Nathan Kiley, with an underscore at the end of it. Um, there's uh, obviously like a link in my in my bio there. So. If you're interested in in any any other things that I've got there, then you can check that out there. And uh, if you've got any questions, uh, I'm more than happy for you to just flick me a direct message, and I'll I'll try and get back to you as soon as I can. Appreciate it.